What's up, everybody? How you doing? Good to see you guys here today. I invite you to grab the teaching notes that you received as you came in as we are going to be hanging out in John chapter 17 today. So if you got your Bibles, you can turn to John chapter 17. Have you ever had someone listen in on one of your conversations? Would you raise your hand if you have been there before someone was maybe eavesdropping or, or they heard something that you said and you didn't think someone was listening? Or how about this? Have you ever had it where you sent a text message to someone on accident? You thought you were sending it to someone else? And then when you realize that happened, you were freaking out, going, oh, what did I say, what did I say? I had it just a, a couple years ago where, where someone sent me a text message that was very clearly, clearly meant to go to his wife, but he sent it to me <laughs> on accident. And so I had this moment of, do I say something? Do I not? Then it's all creepy when he realizes that I, he did it and he comes back to me. So I said, hey, I don't think this was meant to go to me. And we got a good chuckle out of it. How about this? Would you raise your hand if you have an Amazon Alexa or an Amazon Echo? Would you raise it loud and proud? If you got one of those in your home, I just heard uh, or read or heard of a story a couple years ago where, where the, the, the good sister Alexa was triggered, and, and, and she began to record the conversation of a couple in their home, and then she emailed that conversation to one of the guy's employees. And so his employee gets this email with this entire conversation that his boss had with his wife in their home, and he comes to his boss in the following days and says, hey, I just... Just think you should know that Alexa recorded your conversation and emailed it to me. And the guy's like, no, it did not. No, no, no. He goes, no, it did. You were talking about hardwood floors. And, uh, and the guy's like, oh, my goodness. And then just, did you read the article a couple, couple days ago? That, that, that Amazon pays thousands of people to listen in on conversations through Amazon Alexa? Isn't that kind of creepy? And they're transcribing stuff. It's kind of weird when you know someone is, is listening in on one of your conversations. And yet in John chapter 17, we have this huge privilege, this honor of, of listening in or reading this conversation of prayer that Jesus is having with the Father. So we're going to hang out in John 17 today and look at some different prayers that were taking place. There. But just even before we get to that, we've been talking the last number of weeks in the Gospel of John and about the, the I am statements of Jesus, and now we're, we're in a, just uh, the few weeks leading up to Easter, obviously today being a Palm Sunday, just celebrate this week and how Jesus went to the cross for us. And here in this text today, he is nearing that point, and this prayer that we're looking at today has been called the consecration prayer or the farewell prayer. If you want to write that down in your note sheet, you certainly can, the consecration prayer or the farewell prayer prayer as Jesus is, is having this prayer. And, and there's a couple things that, that we realize and we can really learn right here even before we dive in. First of all, do you notice that, that Jesus was always in prayer? Multiple times as he leading up to the end of his time on earth, Jesus was in prayer. He was in prayer uh, at the Last Supper. He was in prayer here before the disciples. He was in prayer in the garden leading up to the cross. And when we have significant moments in our lives, that difficult work meeting, that difficult conversation, that season of challenge, man, let's not go into those on empty, but let's follow the example of Jesus and be prayed up for those moments. So whether you're at school going into a test, whether you're at work going into a meeting, man, let's pause, take some time, pray so we don't go into those on empty. And then Jesus reminds us in John 16, 33, that, that we have victory. Jesus ultimately is victorious. And he, he's having this conversation with, this, the, with the disciples and saying, listen, there's going to be some grief and the world is going to hate you, 
There's going to be some challenge, but take heart. I have overcome the world. Let me just encourage you that no matter what you're facing right now, no matter what you're going through, we can approach those circumstances from a place of of victory because Jesus is victorious. And and it might not look just the exact way that you think it's going to look, but we can approach all of the difficulty and challenges that we face in life from a perspective of God will get me through this, God will help me, God will deliver me, God will give me the victory. So who was Jesus praying for in John 17? Number one is this, he was praying for himself. Let's read verses one through five to start. After Jesus had said this, he he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Here, check this out. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. You might want to circle that part. Now this is eternal life. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do, And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. I'm reading that text, and it reads, Father, glorify your Son, that I may glorify you. And I'm like, whoo, over my head, what is he talking about there? So dive in, do just a bit of research. And what what Jesus is saying there is that he had glorified the Father through his life and his time on earth. He, he, he had lived a perfect and sinless life. And really, as he moved towards his death on the cross and his resurrection, this, this, this week is really the climax of the incarnation, the incarnation being God in human flesh and the personal work of Jesus Christ. And now Jesus prays that, that the Father would glorify him and strengthen him and sustain him and return to the place that he was before the world began. And then Jesus says, now this is eternal life. And we find, uh, again, Jesus saying, eternal life is found in me, in Jesus and Jesus alone. And we've seen that narrative woven into the Gospel of John the last number of weeks. You might remember Mitch a number of weeks ago in the I Am series talked about how he knows who Gary Payton is, but he doesn't personally know Gary Payton or have a relationship with him. Just last week, I talked about how you pull up a map on your phone and there's multiple routes to get to the same destination. That's a great way to get to a burger joint or to avoid traffic, but it's bad theology because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Here again, Jesus says, this is eternal life. It's the one who knows Jesus. So eternal life is knowing God personally. It's not enough just to know that there is a God or to know about God. In fact, the Greek word for know in this text, if you want to write it down in your note sheet, is gnosko, G-I-N-O-S-K-O. And what it refers to is an experiential relationship. An experiential relationship relationship. Each and every one of us understand that there's a difference between hearing about something and experiencing it firsthand. So we we can hear about the Grand Canyon. We can hear about Niagara Falls. We can hear about what it's like to, to be at a Seahawks playoff game. But hearing about something is very different than experiencing it firsthand. And what Jesus is saying here is is we all must experience him and receive his gift of grace and mercy firsthand. Can I ask you this? Have you done that? Man, have you given your life to Jesus? Have you trusted in him for the forgiveness of your sins? Is Jesus just someone that you have heard about or you know about? but you haven't yet had that personal experience or relationship with him. Well, what a beautiful Sunday on Palm Sunday to give your life to Jesus, accept his gift of grace. I encourage you to do that today. 
And then Jesus says what? He says, Father, I have finished the work that you gave me to do. Jesus was focused on the mission that God had for him. Even though he knew that he could, he could, he could decline the cross, he was focused, laser focused on accomplishing the mission and the vision that God had for his life. Man, let, let's let that be our heart's prayer. God, would you help me not to get distracted? Help me not to get too busy? Help me not to get consumed with other things that I forget the mission and the purpose you have given me in life. God, I want to get to the end of my life and I want to look back and be able to say like Jesus, God, I have finished the work that you called me to do. Man, the, the, the talents and the abilities that you have given me, the heart, the, 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 the vision, the mission that you have given me, man, I was about your work throughout the course of my life. And I believe it's important that we also, as a church, keep that heart. That we say, God, you know what? We're not going to get consumed with ourselves. We're not going to be, one, uh, you know, a country club church that's all about just us being exclusive and hanging out together. No, God, we want to be an arrows out church. Man, we want to be a church that's reaching out to this community, communicating the life changing message of Jesus Christ. We are simply an army here that's linking arms, doing work for the Lord. And even here as we, as we embark on this next week, man, Easter, celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. Man, let's be an army. Thank you to, to all those who have signed up to serve. Man, thank you to all those who are inviting and reaching out to your neighbors and, and coworkers and friends and grabbing invite cards. Let's be an army and believe that that salvation will take place next Sunday. Amen? Secondly, Jesus is praying for the disciples. Look at verses 9 through 19. It says, I pray for them, I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine, and glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. That is a reference to Judas there. I'm coming to you now, but I say these things while I'm still in the world that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word and the world has hated them for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. Would you circle, highlight, underline that phrase right there in your Bible or in your note sheet? My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. Here it is again. They are not of the world even as I am not of it. Sanctify them. There's a, there's a super spiritual word for you. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you've sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself that they too may be truly sanctified. So what Jesus understands is that he is coming to the end of his time on earth, but the disciples will remain. That they would then expand and grow and build the church. And so he takes time to Pray for them. And what does he say multiple times? He says, they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. Now just think about that. Man, my heart, my prayer for them is that they would not be of the world any more than I am of the world. Well, would you write this down? I believe it's a fill-in in your note sheet. We are to be in the world, but not of the world, to be a witness to the world. We are to be in the world, but not of the world, to be a witness to the world. In, in earlier centuries, some, as the world began to corrupt the church, some felt that monasticism was the only way 
to be separated from the world. And so what you had is the, the, these communes and 10-foot walls and people would separate themselves so they weren't corrupted or influenced by the world. Some even took it to extremes and became hermits and lived in caves so they weren't corrupted by the world. But that really misses the, the heart of the gospel, what Jesus is saying here. Notice that Jesus doesn't pray that God would send rescue planes to swoop them up. God doesn't pray that, that he would, Jesus doesn't pray that God would give them bubble wrap encasing so they're protected from the world. No, he wants them and us to be salt and light. The challenge for all of us is to be in the world but not of the world. And there are differences there. Think of it this way. How many of you have ever been scuba diving before? Would you raise your hand if you've been scuba diving before? I've never been scuba diving before. I don't really have a desire to scuba dive, to be honest with you. I don't know what it is. I thought about it this last week. I thought, I must be weird. Because I don't want to fly in the air, nor do I want to be in the ocean. I just want, want, I want my feet on the ground. I don't know why. For some reason. But some people love scuba diving. And I think in some ways that illustrates what it's like to be in the world but not of the world. That when you are scuba diving, you are in the water, but you are not of the water. You don't become a fish or Aquaman when you get in the water. <laughs> you are in the water, you're observing, you're enjoying the beauty of the creation, but your, your source of life does not come from the water. That's why you have an oxygen tank. Your, your sense of life comes from another source. It's an example, I think, of what it means to be in the world, but not of the world. And that's why Jesus says here, sanctify them. And that, that word in the original language, sanctify, means set apart for God's use. So we are to be in the world, world, we are to be in our school, and in our place of employment, and in our neighborhood, and in our home. But in that, we are set apart, we are sanctified for God's use wherever he places us. Now, well, what are some different ways that we can really just live that out? These aren't fill-ins, but if you want to write them down somewhere, I would encourage you to. Here's some different ways that we can really be in the world, but not of the world that I have here. Number one, how about this? Remember that this world is not our home. It begins by every day waking up and reminding ourselves that this is not my home. My time on earth is one giant big Airbnb. Just minus the creepy live stream Ireland video. It's one big Airbnb that I'm a part of. This is, this is not my home. I'm a visitor. I am a tourist here. Have you ever been a tourist in a foreign land and felt like you stood out before? Would you raise your hand if you've been there before? Speak a different language. You look different. You don't blend in. We are not called to blend in. We're called to stand out with different values and different priorities and being set apart. So we live on a different path than the world and its priorities and values. And man, just, just as this past school year was kicking off, I wanted to, to impress this on our daughter's hearts, and, and I don't preach them too often in our home, but, but I got, kind of got into a rhythm with my daughters, and, and I tried to communicate this message of, guys, we, we've got to just really not live for the priorities and values of the world as you go to school. In fact, I've got Mitch and Eric are going to help me out. So here's what I did. I, I, I was hanging out with my daughters in, in our living room, and I went and got some toilet paper to communicate what I was wanting to communicate to them. And, and, and I, I, we have our front door in our house, and I'm in the living room, and, and like we have a door right here. And I said, I said, girls, here's what I want you to think about. That door right there, our front door, but that's just a door, that is the door to God's blessing in your life. And man, if I could speak to all the students in the house today, all the J-high, high school, Students, K, okay. let me hear you, J High and high school students. Where are you out in the house today? Let me hear you. There you go. Good job, Riker. Way to go, okay? 
Okay, so right there we got, okay, speed this in your life. That there's a door to God's blessing in your life. All right, and I said, I want you to think about it a couple years from now. Think five, ten years from now. Don't get focused in the moment right now, but I want you to think about your life five, ten, fifteen years from now. Man, what could it look like? What does God's blessing and favor in your life look like? So we talked about, wow, using your gifts for God, fulfilling the unique plan and purpose he has for your life. Man, have, having a, a marriage and kids, if that's what God has put in your heart, that's the path right there. That's the door of God's blessing. Okay, and, and here's the deal. There is a path that will lead you there. And so you've got to stay focused, set apart, sanctified to experience all that God has for you. And what's going to happen is this, as you're cruising down this path, there's going to be influences in the world. There's going to be a tug and a pull at your school, in your junior high, in your high school, in your university. As you're going down this path, you're going to see people and they're going to try to pull you this way and go down this road. And maybe a lot of people are going down that road. A lot, a lot, a lot of people are cruising down that road. Say, come with us, come on, get off this path. And if you go down this road with the crowd, with other people, it's taking you away from the doorway of God's blessing in your life. So you've got to have the strength and the spiritual fortitude to say, no, I'm not going to go that way, I'm not going to go that way. I've got bigger plans in my life called God's blessing and favor. And that might mean that I stand out just a little bit. Because I've got different values and different priorities and different goals and different agendas. I want to experience God's best for me. This is not our home. This is a temporary dwelling place for us. How about this? The second way you might want to write this down. we got to watch what we feed ourselves. I've never had deep fried butter before. But, but Manny, Manny, didn't you have deep fried butter at the fair? Oh, deep fried Oreo, okay, gotcha. Deep, there's deep fried, there's a lot of deep fried things you could have. Deep fried Oreos, deep fried butter, you could have a lot of deep fried things. Have you had deep fried butter before? Raise your hand if you've had deep fried butter before. Is it good? It's okay? Man, I just can't get my head around that one. Could you imagine living on a steady diet of deep fried butter? I don't think you're going to be able to run a marathon very well if you do that. So we got to be sure that we are feeding ourselves source of life and, and health and spiritual nourishment. So we ask ourselves, man, what am I watching? What am I listening to? Who am I hanging with? Is it breathing life and vitality into my walk with God? And then how about this? Number three is this, form godly habits. The third way to, to just be in the world but not of the world. Form godly habits. Man, can I just encourage you with this? A one hour Sunday morning gathering is, just cannot be your sole spiritual growth funnel. If this is the only place and only time that you're looking to grow spiritually, you're going to be left very hungry. And that's why we have got to be reading the Bible and praying, playing worship music in our homes. We have to form godly habits. If this is your only source of spiritual growth on a Sunday morning, you're going to be left hungry and you're going to be frustrated. And you're going to be saying things like, well, I'm just not growing. Well, no, no one meal a week will sustain us for an entire week. We should view Sunday mornings as, it's like a cherry on top. It, it, it's, like a, it's like dessert. That we gather together, why? To pray for one another, to high five one another, to hug one another, to encourage one another, to, to worship our God together, meant to, to hear and open up the Bible together. But it cannot be our sole source of spiritual growth alone. It has to be a small part of how we 
seek to grow spiritually in our life. In fact, you know, Carrie has mentioned that some of the most profound times that God has spoken to her is not in a church service, but when she's alone at home reading her Bible. And God just speaks to her that way. Secondly, the, sec- the, uh, the third uh, group that Jesus prays for is Jesus prayed for all believers. Look at verses 20 through 23. He says, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete what? Unity. Unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. I was talking just last Sunday night. Grace was at junior high life group. And so me and Carrie and Kylie were hanging out in our kitchen and just talking about this message a bit, trying to sharpen it and kind of get my head around it a little bit. And, And Kylie, I thought, just reminded us of just the fact that that here Jesus is right near the cross. And who was on his heart, who was on his mind? Others, other people. Even though he's about ready to experience incredible pain for us that we are so grateful for on a Palm Sunday. But in that moment, facing that level of pain, we were on his heart and mind. Think about that. We were on his heart and mind. And and what did he pray for? He prayed for our unity, a a deep and abiding spiritual unity for all of his followers. Carrie Carrie went her first year to Central, public university for college, Then she went to Northwest University, a Christian school for a year. Then she went back to Central for the last couple of years. And and so she has this unique perspective of being in a public university and then going to a private and then back to a public. And she shared it that when she went back to Central after being at Northwest, man, she was just energized to be in relationship and friendship and meet anybody who was a Christian. It didn't matter their personality. It didn't matter their background. She was just looking for other Christians that she could be friends with and be and sharpen one another. Because when, when you're brothers and sisters in Christ, there's a bond that unites you together. Amen? There, there, there's a bond. And I believe what Jesus is really encouraging us with in this text is to focus on what unites, not that which divides. Have you found that it's so easy that, to, to focus on that which divides? That I, I believe with our human nature, we, we can agree on, on 95% of stuff. But if there's 5% that we disagree on, it's possible to focus all of our time and all of our efforts and all of our energies on the 5%. But Jesus is saying, man, just focus on what unites. Now, what what unites us together? Man, the resurrection, grace, mercy, salvation, the mission that God has given us. There is so much more that unites us as believers than that which divides. And Jesus is saying, man, focus on unity. Be unified in the mission. In fact, he says in Romans, to have the same mind towards one another that Christ has. Woo! Now think of that. Man, think about the grace that Jesus has for us. Think about the mercy that Jesus has for us. Think about the unconditional love that Jesus has for us. And Jesus says, now take that and apply that to your marriage. Apply that to your family. Apply that to your coworkers. Apply that to your church. How would our life change? if we just live that out. And so we just link our arms and say, God, we're gonna be united because we got a mission to do. 
we've got work to do. And we want to get to the end of our lives and say, God, I did the work you called me to do. Amen. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me here today? I just want to ask if you're here and maybe on this Palm Sunday as we think about just who Jesus is and what he accomplished for us. You're saying, Jeff, I've drifted. And I, today I need to really recommit my life to Jesus. Maybe you're here and for the first time you need to take that step. So I want, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to put him at the center of my life. Whether you're here, whether you're watching online right now, man, if that's you, would you say, would you just raise your hand right now saying, Jeff, would you include me in this prayer? I'm not going to ask you to do anything weird, but just saying, Jeff, would you pray for me? Raise your hand right now. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you, thank you, thank you, guys. Yes, I see those hands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lord, we thank you for those who are taking that step. Lord, we celebrate your resurrection. We celebrate your death on the cross and what that means for us. You give us life. Lord, I pray for those that are raising their hands right now, that they right now would say, Jesus, would you come into my heart? Would you forgive me for my sins? Today, I give my life to you. Today, I put you at the center, you on the throne of my life. Would you forgive me? Would you cleanse me? Would you make me a new creation? And from here on out, I want to live for you. I want to do the work you called me to do. And Lord, I pray for every one of us that, that this next week we would be about your heart. We would be about your mission. Lord, that you would help us to be people of grace and mercy and have your mind towards others. I pray that you'd use this this next week to, to, to look for opportunities to, to love others and serve others and invite people to church. I pray that this next week you would give us supernatural opportunities to do that. And we just pray even right now for next Sunday that it would be a day that your kingdom is advanced around the world for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen, amen. Hey, can we give a wild applause to all those who raised their hands saying, Jesus. Man, I'm going to commit or recommit my life. If you did raise your hand, can I encourage you, swing by the Connect Center in the lobby, have some information we'd love to give you for your faith journey. So please stop by there for just about 15, 20 seconds. Let's stand to our feet. Thanks so much for hanging out today. God bless you. You're dismissed.